On this episode of Bootstrappers, we're going to talk about the nature of remote work, what works and what doesn't, with author of Running Remote, Liam Martin. That's on this episode. Welcome to Bootstrappers, where we talk about topics that are important to real estate and property management entrepreneurs. I am your host, Gwen Aspen, here with my spouse, Jeremy Mwah. Aspen. And we have such an exciting show today. I'm super excited to talk to Liam Martin, who is the author of Running Remote, uh, Master the Lessons from the World's Most Successful Remote Work Pioneers. Liam also is CEO, CMO of Time Doctor. Captain Sparkles. Captain, That's Captain Sparkles. Sparkles, to be honest. Please. Thank you. Time Doctor is a time tracking software for remote teams. Um, and at any rate, we're super excited to talk about this topic because we've run remote teams since 2008. We have run remote teams now. And I think uh, Liam and I and Jeremy all believe in the future of this, but maybe do it in different ways. And maybe some of the audience can learn from um, our different philosophies. So yeah, and really we're here to just show Liam where he's wrong. <laughs> I think it's what it boils right down to. No, uh, so Bootstrappers is powered. I'm super excited about that. <laughs> It'll be fun. You want to be a thought yeah. leader? Let's do the thinking, right? Um, Bootstrappers, that's, that, that's what we want to do. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, Bootstrappers is powered by Anaquim. If you're looking for professionals who can help you grow your business, uh, go to anaquim.net right now to, uh, and to set up a discovery call. If you set up a discovery call and mention Bootstrappers, you'll get a 50% discount on your placement fee. So let's get into let's talking. First about question this. I have for you guys. I want to ask a question first. Yes, let's do it. Why did you do the .net? Why not .com? Because actually, you know where the name of the company came from? <laughs> it was a small air. It's the fastest single engine experimental airplane at the time. It was the Anaquim, which is oh. Portuguese for Mako Shark. So we went to go uh, look at it and buy it. And I tried going through the whole process. We'd already started on the name, never got a hold of anybody. And so we settled on net. Plus, mm -hmm. and plus, okay. actually, it was more of a. It was a. It was a little bit more thought out than that. We picked it because it sounded better. <laughs> not really. But, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's so, a good answer or not, but that's probably the most honest answer. About twelve years ago, we started Staff dot com, which was a two sided marketplace for remote workers, which ended up not succeeding. But then before we ended up buying staff.com as a domain, we bought mystaff.com because the guy was negotiating with us for like, it was like $550,000 at the time okay. for the domain. And uh, we were like, ah, it's, a lot. Ah, it's over half a million dollars for a domain name 12 years ago. We're not going to do that. And then um, he started emailing people and, no, and people would start to go to staff.com directly, which was a 404. And so it was just creating a lot of problems. And so we ended up actually buying staff.com, which is maybe, I mean, maybe a good business decision and maybe a bad decision. They, actually, those those base domains, they appreciate at about 11% per year. Really? Which really? is better than the stock market. Yeah, it's really interesting to be able to see like icecream.com, dog.com, all that kind of stuff. These top tier domains grow really, really well. And what kind of put the nail in the coffin for me as to why staff.com was the right decision is timedoctor.com. I would email, I would cold email people, Liam at timedoctor.com. And then I would cold email Liam at staff.com, which by the way, you can email those. You won't get me, you'll get my assistant, just to kind of warn you guys beforehand. <laughs> and staff.com had double the response rate really? of Time Doctor. Yeah, because it was just, a top tier domain and people are like, whoa, staff.com. Okay. I'm going to go check really? that out. So I think about like virtual real estate in a really specific way. And uh, I don't know how many people that might've just tossed in the .com and thought, oh, okay. Yeah. It must be a .com. Yeah. Well, no, it, we didn't think it through that well. We, we wish we could have, but <laughs> the Anaquim, you know, it's always, it's A-N-E-Q-U-I-M.net. It's not a, a anything like a, what'd you call it? A base domain. It's kind of a rough one, but it's the name of the company is <laughs> so, working so far. But I want to get uh, into your background a little bit, Liam. So tell us a little okay. bit about yourself. Sure. My name's Liam. I'm currently in my closet. And uh, I don't know if you guys can, probably you can't see this, see this if you're listening to it. But my shower is right over there. 
and actually, and my daughter's kind of room is in this other walk-in closet. <clears throat> and I've been working remotely for almost 20 years. Oh, uh, wow. I love remote work. We have a mission statement that flows through everything that we do, which is our goal is to help empower the world's transition towards remote work. And we've been doing it over these almost 20 years with uh, teams of about 150 team members in 40 different countries all over the wow. world. We don't have an office because I work out of this closet and I don't think my other team members actually work out of closets. I don't know what they work out of, but fundamentally we don't have a uh, we don't have an office or a closet. We don't want one and we really think that you can build world-class companies without that infrastructure, which was a crazy idea until about February of 2020. That's yes, absolutely it true. But it's still controversial, which is why it's an interesting topic to talk about today. Well, um, and I'll, I'll, let me just uh, kind of to buttress Liam's point. When we got into this business, the notion of hiring somebody in another country that worked remotely was such a novel idea. And then, uh, and it was interesting, it would happen, it would come up in conversation at conventions and, and it became kind of like, the, the interest became what, that, that we could do that. And nowadays, a lot of our growth is propelled by the fact that now everybody knows that it's not only possible, but there's no way around it. And it happens to mm. probably be less expensive in a lot of cases. But I do want to say there are people who contradict this notion that it creates a good culture. In fact, I think uh, in August of 2022, Malcolm Gladwell, who's a writer, thinker, best known for the books Blink and Outlier, um, he's also a writer for The New Yorker, um, he declared that remote work is bad for society for companies and for people doing it and it's he says it's not in your best interest to work at home um and he also says that uh i know it's a hassle to come to the office but if you're just sitting in your pajamas in your bedroom is that the work life you want to live also elon musk made everybody come back to the office and said if you aren't going to come back i'm going to just assume you don't want to work here um so there are i think it was people. stop pretending to work at home oh and come into the yeah office. yeah Maybe. it was some kind of right. memo that was leaked yeah yeah yes and, and then but mark ander uh, andreessen who's a world famous tech investor venture capitalist and tech industry um guru if you want to uh to say that he says that uh remote work and this is from your book a quote i stole from your book liam is a permanent civilization shift a consequence of the internet that may be even more important than the internet itself so we're really kind of in this arena where there's a big controversy we're trying to come up with uh what the what the perfect balance is so um i think liam and, and time doctor and your mission uh, and the way that you run your company is as a as completely remote uh, organization. And we have historically worked with you know, some, our 900 employees. Most of all work remotely. And though what we've kind of been doing is dialing back, and this is where I think the, inter the conversation gets interesting, we've been dialing back a little bit, trying to have a little bit more face-to-face. -face. And then, of course, the question becomes, what's the mechanism with which we, buy, we do that? Is it, you know, do we fly to Mexico? Do we fly to the Philippines and have meetings with our employees? Uh, do, do we have an office down in those countries? You know, what, what's the way to get there? And that's where I think this conversation needs to go because it's probably what everybody's asking right now. And so one of the things I found interesting about your book is your discussion about the asynchronous workforce. So Jeremy and I, our company does not work asynchronously, except for our call center, which is 24 seven. Everybody works on central standard time, eight to five, essentially. So can you just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how your culture is asynchronous? asynchronous and how that works well and what asynchronicity is in in this context sure yeah i mean i think it's a it's a very difficult kind of idea for people to be able to get their heads around and that's why for me we wanted to write this book so one of the things that was quite interesting when i started interviewing all of these remote founders and it's effectively 36 interviews with seven eight and nine figure remote first founders and operators and so that were remote before the pandemic. And I asked them, how are you different from everyone else? And the answer that I was getting was continuously asynchronous work and not just asynchronous work, 
But the methodology of asynchronous work, which I'm coining as asynchronous management, which I'm reading from the intro here, is the practice of leading individuals or teams without simultaneous or synchronous communication. All collaboration and information are funneled through online systems. Work fo focuses on individual autonomy, allowing all team members to maximize their own productivity without being dependent upon others to complete a task or provide updates. So there's a much simpler way of communicating it. I don't know how old you guys are, but I remember back in the 90s, if I couldn't watch Friends on Friday at 8.30, if I couldn't catch that show, then on Monday I was left out of all of the fun conversations yeah, yeah. at school. Right. So I sometimes show up at like 8.45 and you have to wait an entire year before a rerun of Friends to be able to come out. <laughs> and so that's really synchronous communication, which is there's a certain moment in which you can consume that information. And if you're not present during that particular moment to consume that information and add to it, the opportunity has been lost. Asynchronous communication is the information is available to you when you want to be able to consume it, a la Netflix, where I can watch as much friends as I want, uh, and it's ready for me whenever I actually want to be able to consume it. So if you build your business operations off of an asynchronous model in which people can say, you know what, I really don't want to actually do a call at three o'clock in the morning, even though I love talking to Gwen on a regular basis, but I don't really want to talk to her at three o'clock in the morning. Well, you can use asynchronous forms of communication so that Gwen, you can record that information, talk about it. Um, through like a loom or through some other type of project management system. And then it's available for that worker whenever it's most opportunistic for them to be able to consume it. So a question about the supervision of an asynchronous environment. Um, you know, one of the nice things, well, a couple of things that we as humans need to have, we need to, we need, we're social beings um, and we wanna make sure that we have stability, that we feel stabilized, right? Like there's that security. Um, the when When there's, an asynchronous uh, model, it seems like you're going to have to have work that's being done, and then later on there might come a trailing supervisor that's going to have to do some data mining uh, or, or some some variety of, of mining for information to check to see that the work was done and that the done was uh, that the work was done correctly. Whereas in a physical environment. Um, it can almost be recognized as being done with a nod or with a quick little conversation. And it feels like there's a lot of opportunities where that sort of supervision is going to be less than optimal. Have you found that to be the case in, in, in the way that you're operating? Generally, the way that we look at it is we have this philosophy that the platform is the manager, not the okay. individuals. And when you look at what a manager does on a regular basis, about 80% of their time is, to your point, confirming that work is done and communicating that information to the next layer up in the chain. Mm -hmm. So internally, we our version of a policy, which is radical transparency. So inside of this, everyone has at least one quantifiable longitudinal metric. So how many clicks am I getting to the website? How many trials do I have? How many customers did I close? Those types of things. And that information is automated, meaning that information is put up on that dashboard through a lot of automated systems that we've already built, regardless of whether or not the employee that's responsible for it wants it to actually go up. So it's actually like a third party system. And then on top of that, all of those metrics are available to everyone inside of the company. We really want to be able to have everyone effectively have the same informational advantage as the CEO of the company. And if they can do that, then it allows them to be a lot more autonomous in their decision making because they effectively already know what's in your heads right now. And they can make much better decisions if they have that information as opposed to it being protected through a whole bunch of gatekeepers, managers, VPs, directors, that kind of thing. So you guys have like a Ray Dalio type methodology. Are you familiar with Ray Dalio is. I don't know that one. He's a yeah. Bridgewater. He was the CEO and he's like a huge advocate for radical transparency. And he does it through mm. technology as well. Whereas when you're having a meeting, if people don't like what you're saying, you press a button that's like, stop talking. Like, this is not helpful. <laughs> like, it's like real time. <laughs> so, I don't know if I have. To. 
<laughs> so we have we do we do grab from Elon Musk's uh, philosophy, which is uh, if you don't like a meeting, walk out of it. And we have that same philosophy, which is synchronous time is the most precious time. Well, your time generally is the most precious resource inside of the company. And what we want everyone to do is really optimize the entire organization towards deep work, which is. Uh, what my friend Cal Newport talked about in his seminal book that's referenced a lot in the remote first community. If you can optimize people towards in-depth productive work, then you end up moving your organization faster than if you're not doing that. Okay, I love this conceptually. Um, I wanna love it, but we've struggled uh, in our in our personal lives as well as our professional lives with written communication being the best way to discuss things. In fact, with our family, we often recommend stop texting, get on a phone call, like things are getting lost in this text message string, for example. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes actually having that conversation where you can hear tone, if it's in video, you could see body language, it improves the, the true transfer of the information also, it allows for more trust to be involved. And then in addition to the difficulty of people just having like technology created ADD. And so sometimes like emails can be too long. So, you know, there's like the TLDR, uh, like too long, didn't read. How do you ensure right. that people are prepared for a meeting and how do you coach them on better communication so they don't piss people off with tone or things being misunderstood? So there is, there's a lot of uh, answers. You asked a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, I there. know. I'm sorry. But about I'll, I'll kind of just, so the, <laughs> just the first one is from an archetype, from an archetypal perspective, our internal policy is instructions shouldn't be easy to understand, but impossible to misunderstand. And that's okay. a little bit of a switch mentally. Yeah. yeah which it is, is, if I'm going to take that extra 30 seconds to explain what, um, in the last podcast that I was in this morning, what EMPS is, which is Employee Net Promoter Score. Well, I would hyperlink that inside of that email and I would maybe link it to a Wikipedia article. There's actually a widget that I use, an extension that I use inside of Gmail that automatically does that for a lot of terms. Oh, so that if anyone's confused about a weird term, yeah. they can just click on it and it's like, oh yeah, that's what it is. Oh, it's an Employee Net Promoter Score. Okay, Brilliant. I got it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so the other part that I think you would be surprised at is I agree with you with regards to synchronous communication. So asynchronous organizations, even though I did review a lot throughout the book that are like 100% asynchronous, GitLab is a perfect example of that, where they try to remove all forms of synchronous communication. But for us, we actually have more of a kind of communication pyramid. So in-person is better than video, better, video is better than audio, audio is better than instant messaging, and yeah. instant messaging is better than email. As you move up the chain, you become more synchronous. And as you move down the chain, you become more asynchronous. But you'd have a very strong base of email. So what's the best way to be able to communicate with someone? It's communication in which that information can be documented for the future. Let's say that you guys want to sell your business in the future. Due diligence is a real thing and it's a nightmare. Uh, the ability to be able to have no undocumented conversations and communication inside of your organization allows for everyone to kind of go in almost kind of like a business anthropologist to be able to say, what happened two years ago with regards to why we decided to enter the dental industry for the virtual assistant space, right? Why did we decide to do that? Oh, it was because Gwen thought that we should do ABC and now Gwen doesn't believe that and we should actually reverse that decision. And Jeremy so was that right. Document, and Jeremy was right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then even just kind of when you look at it in a greater way, uh, for us, we're really focused on those in-person per conversations. And we do things like a company retreat every single year. We fly everyone into one particular location. Gonna... That's a really good way for us to reserve a lot of those. I have a personal saying, which is the secret to life is being comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. I reserve a lot of those uncomfortable conversations in person mm. because you want to be able to make sure that people see your nonverbal communication, the cadence that you have, those types of things. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, uh, we actually have an entire 
process document built on how to communicate clearly inside of organizations. And uh, we include that inside of the book for anyone that's kind of interested. Yeah, we have one of those uh, too. I'm going to use yours. So what are some of those yeah. tips and tricks? Because this is an area where, you know, companies get siloed, trust is lost, people uh, get up said about things like what are some tips and tricks that help with that very precise communication i think you call it precise and deliberate communication yeah so number one before you even get into that you have to come in with this mindset of always assume positive intent amen that's, that's very, exactly right I, <laughs> and you guys so, always go back to that because people i feel like naturally and we we train on that but people naturally yeah. it's you have to reframe your ba- brain for that. It's- you can assume that everybody, that whoever it is you're having a problem with is not an enemy, which is the way you're treating them or the way that you're reacting to them. And yeah. that's a dangerous thing to do. One of the people in the book um, is uh, the CEO of our company, and they were one of the first employees for WordPress, which is a very famous oh, yeah. remote asynchronous organization. And he got this email from a senior engineer when he was playing with the code base, which was a one-liner saying, please fix, Um, which you would think is very negative, right? That this person was quite angry, but that's just the way that this person communicated. Now, that person should have actually had training as well on how to make sure that they're communicating properly. But fundamentally, you need to always assume positive intent, <clears throat> because if you don't, then you end up making mountains out of molehills. Mm-hmm. And you think to yourself, oh, this person, another point, which is really central to most remote communication, never, ever have a meeting without an agenda. So you guys probably don't know this as well, but I could guarantee you probably someone in your organization does this, which is the manager sets up a meeting with the employee without an agenda and says something like, hey, I need to talk to you tomorrow for about half an hour. Yeah, that's scary. You know, when are you available? That employee is terrified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That entire day into the evening, the next morning, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about? Well, there's no agenda. Uh, my friend Aiden, who runs a company called Fellow, which is another kind of asynchronous management tool, he has this mindset of no agenda, no attenda. And I <laughs> yeah. completely agree with him in that context. Because you really, if you're going to prepare yourself for synchronous communication, which is much more labor intensive than asynchronous communication, it requires a lot more of your attention. You need to be in a particular place at a particular time. Then you need to be able to do as much work beforehand as humanly possible to be able to to make that happen. Uh, The last point is just making sure that when you document things and you communicate asynchronously, you need to make sure that those ideas are very, very clear, that they can't be misinterpreted. And so a great way of doing that would be, I have a, a I have a process on process inside of the book, which I call the four D's, which is discover, design, deploy, and debug, which is you discover why the process existed in the first place. Sometimes it's actually for really stupid reasons. You might need to be able to change it. The second step is you design the process. So you go through all of the steps trying to figure out how you actually should put all of these ideas together in a very clear and concise way. I usually write two versions. So I'll do a video walkthrough as an example, and I'll do a one page document. And maybe even and then someone will watch the video the first time that they consume the process. But then they don't need to watch the 15 minute video the second time that they consume Mm -hmm. the process. They maybe can just reference the document, which is a 30 second quick scan to figure out what the heck they needed to do. You deploy that. And when you deploy it, you ask people, not do you like this process? Because they'll tell the boss every single time, oh yeah, boss process is great, could be horrible, but they just, they're not gonna tell you that it's horrible. Uh, So instead I ask them, what are three things that I can do to improve this process? If there is overlap between the three people that you talk to, you fix the changes in the overlap, you keep going back to the deploy and debug stage, and then probably within two to three variations or iterations, you end up having perfect process. And then that document can exist inside of your organization for the long term. Oh, I like, no, I that. like it has, that. It's filtered like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so one of the other things that you talk about in your book is a KPI, K, sorry, KPI-driven culture, which Jeremy and I couldn't agree more. 
that this is important. Um, but I think a lot of the people in the small business, medium sized business world really struggle not only with coming up with meaningful KPIs, but also teaching their management staff on how to coach people to improve those numbers and really knowing what the number means. And based on that number, what kind of things need to get done to improve it? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So uh, do you have any page... tips on how to fix that, <laughs> that issue? Yeah, so page 88, we have an example of, of our quarterly scorecard. And this is literally right the one that we use inside of our organization mm -hmm. for at least this is the current interpretation of what we have. So they change dependent upon the situation. But your first point is very well placed. Uh, it's super difficult to be able to choose the right numbers to be measured by. So it's really important that you take a long time trying to understand, well, what are the numbers that are really going to move the business? Is it the amount of events that you speak at? Is it the amount of clicks to your website? Is it the amount of revenue that you generate as an organization? Our North Star metric at Time Doctor, as an example, is the amount of hours that tr is tracked on our network. Yeah. That's our absolute, that is what I like to call our compass metric. So that is the most important number. It's more important than money because if the amount of hours go up, we know that engagement is going up and we know that we're going to have lower levels of churn, uh, which mm -hmm. is the amount of customers that leave you every week, month, quarter, whatever. And more importantly, we're going to have more successful trials inside of the organization. So figuring out what actually makes the company tick and I wish there was a clearer process to be able to identify, to try to figure out what those numbers are. But fundamentally, unfortunately, you actually have to figure that out on a case by case basis. You know, an e-commerce website may be completely different from like a SaaS business or a BPO or, you know, a, a government organization. They all have different metrics. But you so fundamentally really could not run your business without it being, you know, KPI driven, I'm assuming. Like that's like a fundamental core of any asynchronous remote business. Absolutely, because the platform is the manager, not the manager. So that brings me on to my next point, which is all of these metrics are third party numbers, meaning inside of and there's another really seminal book that I was inspired to write this one in a large part due to um, a book by Kim Scott called Radical Candor. Oh yeah, I love and that. So, book. <laughs> yeah, so inside of that book, it was a real, it was a, a fantastic set of lessons for me to be able to recognize that you have to treat your direct reports like you're all on the same team. And it's not the manager versus the employee, it's the manager and the employee working together to be able to make sure that they can be successful. And a major way of doing that inside of these remote first asynchronous companies is they take the numbers, the KPIs, and they make them a third party issue, which is, Gwen, I love what you're doing inside of the, you know, I, I love what you're doing. I think you're doing, I think you're working really hard, but these numbers are still not hitting target, right? In the classic kind of EOS, green, yellow, red, uh, we're doing well, we're almost on target, or we're not going to hit target. Yeah. And then what can we do to be able to make sure that we can improve that in the short term? I'm going to try to work with you as the manager to be able to get you there. And the funny thing is that in the vast majority of these synchronous conversations, which I reserve almost entirely for kind of the soft skills connected to management, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? How can I help you get through some barriers that you're currently experiencing? The vast majority of the time, the actual like playbook, everyone knows what they need to do. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you recognize, oh, um, well, you know, our family dog died three mm -hmm. weeks ago and my kids are having a real difficult time with it. Okay, well, this perfect solution is go to betterhelp.com. Let's just hire you a counselor for your kids so that they can get over this or they can at least get through it a little bit easier. Those are the types of things that really counterintuitively accelerate your organization. And they are the things that are given the least amount of attention inside of these non platform based 
measurement systems. Yeah, I, and I'm glad to hear that because we have in our team, we have an advocacy team that uh, are, you know, the, the virtual assistants, remote professionals are assigned an advocate. And so the job of the advocate in part is to identify major events that are happening in their lives, like a death of a mother or of a parent, and send flowers and offer sometimes we have a fund set aside to pay for uh, a, few, a few you know things that need that come up once in a while just to help you know engage in a real personal way because that is one of the things that we give up in a remote world is that you know that face to face that 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 skin on skin kind of connection so this is i think what kind of our way of building team to uh to kind of bring those bring that together team and culture, culture in yeah. a remote uh, a remote world. And so that that's another point that you said is that people shouldn't try to replicate like the in-office experience yeah. remotely. And so when you see people trying to replicate the in-office experience remotely, what are some of those things that you're just like, well, that's ridiculous, that's never gonna work. I'm just curious. Top one is uh, presence. So presence does not equal output. And -E that is, and it, it, like it, sending presence, a present. It's, no, like presence. Like, like oh, I am okay. currently present in an environment, and I am currently working, gotcha. which is counterintuitive for the time doctor to be able to tell you because we're measuring time. Yeah. But one of the things that we've been able to identify time and time again is that uh, the ability to be able to be good at your job does not necessarily correlate to the amount of hours that you invest inside of the, your job. There are other variables that kind of work into that. I don't know if you've ever heard the uh, the story of the two lumberjacks. <laughs> uh, no, uh, yeah, I think I actually, I think, yeah, yeah, it's but, a joke, isn't it? But, but do refresh Yeah, well, Funny. two lumberjacks that are always cutting wood next to each other every single day. One of the lumberjacks leaves at noon an hour every day. And the one that leaves always chops more wood. So one of these days, the second lumberjack gets super frustrated at the first and says, what the heck is going on here? I work my butt off every single day. You're right next to me. You leave for an hour every single day and you chop more wood. What is going on here? Where do you go every day? And he's like, oh, well, I go home to sharpen my ax. Ah. And so yeah. when I think about the way that you want to be effective in terms of just output, you need to have a sharpen ax type of attitude towards work. It's not necessarily who can work the longest that's the most productive. It's the person that can be the most productive when they are working. And so that's probably the biggest thing that I can see. Uh, I, I did an interview with a, um, a company out of Japan and they famously have the salary man phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is if the boss is still in the office, everyone still needs to be in the yeah. office. Mm -hmm. And he actually told me the inside track on this, which was one day he had, uh, his manager was in the main kind of like sales hall of the office and he was building a bike and it was like 11 o'clock at night. And he was like, dude, who are you building this bike for? Like, is it for the company or something like that? He's like, no, no, I'm just building my bike because I need to build my bike. He's like, well, couldn't you go home to do that? He said, oh, well, the boss is still here. I can't leave. Oh, that I'm actually happened. Wasting time at the office. Yeah, that's. I mean, so like that mindset of presence does not actually equal productivity and mm -hmm. output is really important to be able to take into consideration. And this is very important when you think about jobs in which creativity and the and the the goal is how you approach the problem is actually the biggest part of solving it as opposed to the playbook already being written for you. When you think about it in that context, you really want to be able to reward people that are a lot more productive. One quick story that I have kind of connected to this is uh, I had an SDR that, uh, and this was many, many years ago, which is a sales development rep, basically a salesperson that helps qualify leads uh, for our, our companies. And he was outputting way more numbers than anyone else. Like he was doing double what the regular rep was doing. And we were like, dude, what are you doing here? Like you're doing a fantastic job. How are you putting out these numbers? And he just, he wouldn't really tell us because he was shy to admit that he hired someone in uh -huh. the Philippines to be able to qualify all of his leads. 
before he actually qualified them. So he had that first filter before they actually ended up getting to him. Brilliant. And he didn't want to do that because obviously he didn't want there's security concerns with regards to ah. that kind of data uh, moving out of the organization. So they fired him. <laughs> I made him the head of SDRs. Yeah, right. I made him the manager yeah, yeah. of, of yeah. the entire organization. <laughs> I was like, oh, gold star, dude. Like, this is amazing. Can yeah. you do this 80 more times for everyone else right. inside of the company? Yeah. And so that's one of the other parts of this too, which is how do you actually get to your output? Let's be agnostic about the inputs. Let's not, not measure the inputs because sometimes measuring the inputs is where you actually discover the gold mm -hmm. where you could figure out oh well this is where they're sharpening their axe oh this is it this is the aha moment if we just have them do x the entire department can be completely changed in this super meaningful way so you've got to measure the inputs but you need to be somewhat agnostic about them and really focus on the outputs and then figure out how you got to those outputs in the first place. So having used your software, Time Doctor, which actually is a great um, uh, tool in this remote environment for anybody that's interested, I would highly suggest looking at Time Doctor. Um, the, one of the things, one of the metrics that you track, well, a couple of them are keystrokes and mouse activity. How does that factor into um, the calculus for determining, for determining whether or not somebody is a good employee so we use a lot of machine learning to be able to identify that and you'd be quite interested i mean so not to necessarily bore people with artificial intelligence which is really really difficult to be able to get your heads around yes yeah. but essentially like if you uh, a human being can only measure about three or four variables at the same time so it's like how fast am i moving uh what where is the sun in the sky? Um, how many people have red hats on? Like, there's a certain point in which you just break down and you can't figure it out. Men can identify three to five variables at one simultaneously. Women can identify three to seven. So they can. I that's why actually women generally are better at um, being fighter pilots. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're better at multitasking, and they're they're able to identify. They're able to simultaneously take more variables into consideration. Um, a lot of a lot of evolutionary anthropologists believe it's also because they were being hunted more often so they had to be aware of their environment more often like someone else coming out of the bushes and, and trying to kill you uh and so an ai can an analyze hundreds of thousands of different variables at the same time so the way that we use that data is we analyze things like well how often do you how do you interact with your crm as an example, well, one person is way more successful than the other. What kind of, how are they using it? Um, how often do they use it? What times of day do they use it? And all of these things feed into an algorithm that can give you output of saying, well, the reason why this person is really good at their job is because they, um, because they open up their CRM from noon to 1230 every single day as an example. Okay. Like sometimes the, the AI actually gives you a really stupid answer, but they're they're looking at it almost like a savant, uh, not to necessarily bore you guys again, but it's a really interesting subject to be able to figure out, well, why do people, why are certain people better at their jobs that than others? There's like an interesting work fingerprint that works into certain types of people. And then our technology can unlock that and can identify insights that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to track directly. Oh, wow. So, yeah, you got the archetype, and then you must have sub-archetypes, and then it drills all the way down to the person. And so do you do, do you find that the users of your software are using the tracking uh, effectively, though the specifically the keystrokes and mouse? It, it, yeah, it depends. So usually at the end of the day, they don't even see that. Right. They get answers like, oh, well, the reason why your call center, these this top percent of your call center team is really good is because they and it's really counterintuitive stuff like they spend an hour less calling every day that's why they're good yeah that was, <laughs> and then that but that's a that's a stupid answer right but then when you actually look at it and you look inside the data it's like okay. oh but they're actually spending an hour more on their crm mm, than yeah. the other call center reps so they're doing more documentation to be able to keep their leads 
looking good so that when they do so that they can do those callbacks effectively or they can provide email follow-ups and put them into different sequences so you have to look at the data a little bit more like you have to look in between the lines a little bit i wish we could get to a point in which we can say well the reason why someone isn't doing well at their job is because they're not going to the gym Mm-hmm. and they need to go to the gym. They stopped going to the gym six months ago, and it looks like this is impacting their overall productivity, kind of almost like a Fitbit for work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of thing. That's what we usually kind of coin our technology as. Fan. So the, the, I think it's uh, unfortunate, but we end up having to go, otherwise we're gonna blow by our <laughs> average time, the, the, uh, the optimal time for a show. But I would say we need to do this again sometime. I've got a ton of questions. You're gonna be doing a bunch of interviews with this new running remote book which honestly if you're uh, any sort of if you're in business at all you've got to get the book running remote it's uh, one of a whole bunch that are going to be coming out in the near future um, get on top of it get the book um, I, I do have one really kind of probably quick question um, which clock do you use for your because your team is all over the world do you use UTC yeah we're uh, so this, that's funny. Um, we <laughs> we have two versions of company time. So we have company time, which is uh, in Southeast Asia. So it's it's actually Manila time because it links up really well with my business partner who lives uh, in Sydney. Okay. And so uh. we've got we've got about thirty ish people that are on that time zone. But then we also have departmental time. Oh, uh, so like the engineers have their own time in which they want to be able to interact synchronously and they kind of just sync up in that context okay that's like a pretty interesting and i mean it's particularly inside of the remote work world there's a lot of guys that will just be like oh no we need to have one particular time zone there's another group that says no you should be time agnostic because you're working asynchronously it doesn't really matter what time it is and then there's the departmental people and we're currently on departmental and company time um we may end up moving over to a hey it doesn't really matter because about a year and a half ago we started moving company addresses completely asynchronous which was the one meeting that everyone would try to get into but we realized this was actually really impacting people's productivity that were waking up at two three four Mm. o'clock in the morning fascinating right and we can see that through time doctor that's how we were able to analyze that data oh cool interesting well fantastic well this has been so interesting thank you liam for being on the show really appreciate your time and And thanks for writing such a thoughtful book and yeah very cool and when we're up in quebec which you pronounce wrong we are going to come we are going to come and say hi (laughs) (laughs) no we really appreciate thanks a lot yeah thanks a million man so Bootstrappers is powered by Anaquim. If you are looking for professionals who can grow your business, go to anaquim.net right now and set up a discovery call. Again, if you set up a discovery call and mention the word Bootstrappers, you can get 50% off your placement fee. That's a wrap. We'll see you next time on Bootstrappers.